Morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Defo on 5. Jeff DeForest, along with one Mike Luby Lubitz here on 5 Reason Sports Network. And it's always a pleasure to be with you, although uh, we have to examine before we dive into the sports and the phenomenal game played last night by FAU. There was also a couple of great basketball games contested. There was one blowout with uh, UConn winning easily, and all of a sudden, do they not look like uh, they have Final Four written all over them? Uh, UConn, the UConn Huskies, they came into the tournament hot, and uh, they remained hot. And so far, uh, been very dominant. Uh, they, they beat Arkansas handily last night. Uh, FAU uh, over Tennessee. We'll, we'll get into that. And, of course, uh, tonight we have the uh, Canes and Houston. And we'll see if the Canes, uh, we ask this generic sports talk question. You know we love generic sports talk topics, Luby. Who has a better chance to go further in the tournament, FAU or the University of Miami? That's and funny. if you ask us a week ago, we were looking at a very imposing task confronting the FAU Owls, who, uh, you know, even with 30-plus wins, that they still had a lot of people that they would have to convince that they were really legit. And uh, sure enough, they have a relatively unknown coach in Dusty May. We didn't know him until uh, we were plagued uh, with uh, inquiries by Jim Sonny. When are you going to have this coach on? When are you going to have this coach on? <laughs> like, what coach? Lee May is a coach yes, in – uh, you know, I remember him from his days with the Braves, but, uh, you know, I don't remember him coaching basketball. And turned out Dusty May is not only a hell of a guy, but, I mean, you talk about a guy whose star is rising. Never mind Tobin Anderson, who ended up at Iona. He, he might have made a premature evaluation, huh, Tobin Anderson? Oh, he's a guy that was coaching uh, Fairleigh Dickinson. But that might have been one of those things where, uh, you know, Fairleigh Dickinson, I got to get out of here as fast as I can. Yes. Which he did. He actually wasn't on the uh, clock there for even a full calendar year. He, he, he signed his contract, uh, I think, in May of last year, and he didn't make it that far. Not even one uh, year with the school. And then had a meteoric rise courtesy uh, of his big uh, upset victory in, in the tournament uh, when they knocked off a number one seed. And uh, then turns around and uh, doesn't have to face Purdue. FAU doesn't have to face Purdue, courtesy of Fairleigh Dickinson. And uh, here they are, and now in the Elite Eight. So uh, that was great. But uh, a couple of uh, generic questions. I have mad respect now for, uh, remember the pitcher Jim Abbott, who uh, ha had uh, like one hand, and then uh, he, he was a left-handed pitcher, and uh, he, he would have his glove on one hand, and then he would have to move it to the other hand yeah. after he delivered the pitch so that he might be able to feel the ball. Yep. Uh, remarkable respect. And, and uh, the drummer who uh, just, and, and this refutes another one of my theories I was going to offer up today about how safe the streets of South Florida are. Because I, I love going for my walk of life at night. And I'm thinking, you know, this is one of those cities where you don't have to worry about getting stabbed in the back while you're walking around in the darkness. Really? And then, uh, sure enough, uh, you know, I, I was going to bring up Rick Allen, the uh, drummer for Def Leppard, who, how did he do that? With two hands, I couldn't drum as well as this guy did with one. And it seems almost impossible because, uh, obviously, uh, ambidexterity is a big part of it. If you uh, have that uh, capability or have that characteristic, you're, you're going to be a much better drummer than a stiff like me mm -hmm. who is a one, two, tap, tap, one, two, tap, tap. But this guy played drums in a rock band at a very high level of uh, you know rock music achievement with one arm, Luby. Lost his arm in an accident. And then, uh, of course, uh, I was going to say how safe it is down here to walk around at night. And this guy gets mugged in front of the fountain. Blue. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's a nice area. It's not like <laughs> usually where you get mugged. Mugged. Unbelievable, man. And uh, we wish him all the best. But uh, I, I, you know, I'm going to go see Albert Castillo tonight. A fine local guitar oh, player. Nice. Uh, he's in town, uh, you know, oh, at the Funky Biscuit. And he's been traveling uh, and touring with, with his buddy, Mike Zito, who is an extremely, I mean, polished and uh, accomplished musician, owns his own record label, and, and is just a brilliant guy to go watch perform live as well. And uh, they teamed up now and have been touring uh, under the banner of being the Blood Brothers. So uh, I'm going to go see that uh, show tonight. And uh, Albert has a song uh, that uh, has a verse in it, Call the Doctor, Call the Nurse. I don't know what it is, but I know that it hurts. <laughs> and that's where I'm at right now with this uh, right wrist. I, I can't do anything. I, I can't even, uh, like, lift up a pillow. It's amazing. And uh, so Mustang puts out a distress call to a good friend of ours. Uh, I don't want to mention any names, but it happens to be uh, Sean Mack. And uh, I didn't realize it, but right here in our complex, we have our own uh, online pharmacy with free delivery. Because uh, she says, hey, uh, Jeff has a problem with his wrist. Uh, you know, he's uh, feeling a little bit of pain. And he immediately... Do you love this when people immediately diagnose what the problem is because they have similar problems? My so, wife uh, of that. I call her WebMD. Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, yeah, it must be the gout. And I'm thinking, 
Yeah. Could be. I don't know. There's a gout hit your wrist. Um, it's a strange uh, phenomenon. I, I don't know what happened here. It came out of nowhere. I thought it was some kind of tendonitis from playing tennis. Not that I want to bore everybody with the details of my physical maladies. <laughs> Two days in a row. <laughs> but it is weird. I mean, it just is weird that, that it's as painful and inhibiting a, as it is. So mad respect for Jim Abbott. I don't know how he did it with one hand. And uh, this uh, Def Leppard guy. Uh, uh, unbelievable uh, that he was able to drum uh, with one arm because I can't even brush my teeth right now. So Sean Mack with his uh, personal pharmacy just brings me over a generic bag of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, I'll just take them all. Anything to get rid of this, exactly. <laughs> this crap. It'll be great. Can't even, uh, you know, use a pen here to uh, write down a couple of names and uh, numbers. As oh. uh, you know, I have to remind myself uh, uh, what games were there last night. I'm not even sure anymore. Mm. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, and it looked like uh, FAU was going down in routine fashion at Tennessee, did it not? Tennessee was yep. doing all the things that are characteristic of what their success has been uh, founded on uh, all season long, which they, they had uh, a very good season uh, for the most part. That uh, They were a stifling defensive team. They were a very aggressive offensive rebounding team. And uh, they were able to hold teams to uh, under 56 points a game on uh, the entire season. That was the average. They gave up like 56 points a game. And, and here's FAU. They, they want to chuck them up from the outside. And they're playing right into Tennessee's hands with, count them, nine turnovers in the first half. Nine turnovers. They're shooting bricks. Their shooting percentage is extremely low. It looked like UM versus Drake. And I actually turned away from the game because there were other very exciting games uh, being contested at the same time, including UCLA Gonzaga, which turned into another Christian Leitner classic. Yeah, actually, uh, they used the old Villanova play from uh, and actually took that play. Mark View said he took that play from uh, Wright and, and uh, the Villanova Wildcats when, when they beat North Carolina. The uh, remember, they had Diakonu dribble the ball up the court and, and then he passes the ball to a trailer for a three point shot. And uh, it happened last night, but this guy ends up uh, hoisting a 40-footer for uh, Gonzaga to uh, beat UCLA, who had uh, rebounded from a nine-point deficit with, I think, like two minutes or less to go. They're, they're down eight or nine points. They come all the way back. They take the lead with 12 seconds to go and uh, end up losing the ball game on this 40-foot three-point shot. So uh, Gonzaga moves on. That was a team that a lot of people were touting. And it adds credence to your theory, which I think is flawed, Luby. That, uh, you know, because they didn't have the pressure of being a top seed, this would be the year that they would have success and maybe finally break through and win that first national championship for Mark Few. I'm not sure that happens uh, because uh, I I'm thinking if they've had a pattern of choking in the past, unfortunately, as we said uh, yesterday on our uh, Defoe uh, show uh, with, of course, Mike Luby Lubitz on South Florida Live, yes. uh, you know, that, that tendency sometimes perpetuates itself. Never mind uh, the fact that you uh, succumb to the pressure. You're, you're going to succumb under any circumstances because you're a bunch of choking, bleeping dogs. And uh, that, that's uh, always been the characteristic of Gonzaga. But maybe this is the year that they fly through that. And, and then your theory would be correct, Luby. You, you were a subscriber to this uh, generic theory that, well, the pressure's not on, so uh, therefore they might be able to succeed. I didn't say all that. Ken brought it up. The professor who you can check out today, I think. I mean, he had a, a hefty amount of money on Gonzaga. And if that game, I went to bed with, because I had to finish the FAU game. I was really, the way that they pulled away at the end was impressive to me. They were I, getting hammered in the first half, by the way. They, they were down 13, I believe. I, I didn't think they had a chance. I wasn't really paying that much attention to it. And then they... In the second half, they took a lead and they never relinquished it. Yeah. Um, but that was like. Well, they did relinquish it. They were down one with 12 seconds to go. Yeah, Gonzaga went went down one point. There. They oh, were up like nine yeah. points. Sure. Uh, the professor had to be ready to blow his brains out uh, at the end of that ball game. Oh, FAU. FAU. Okay. FAU. Once in the second half, they got up. They got up by double digits. It got down to five, but it never got less than that. So I finished that, and that was like 11.30, and the Gonzaga game had like 12 minutes left. I'm like, there's no way I'm watching that game. So the professor may not join us. Oh, really? I mean, it wasn't that late. I'm up. Right, well, we'll watch the whole thing. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not the professor either. Yeah. Watch the whole game. Well, good for you. Um. I, it was his theory. He brought it up like a month ago. He's like, what's funny this year, no one is paying attention to Gonzaga because they struggled the first month. Yeah. What's well, last year that they'll win? Like, I don't know less pressure or any of that crap. I just know it's it, the last two years. They've been the dominant force. Two years ago, they had Suggs. They had Timmy. Uh, they had Timmy and Holmgren last year. Last year, they had Holmgren, the number two pick, and they had Timmy. 
This year they went under the radar, so I'm like, that's your watch. They'll go back. Hey, how many years has Timmy been in school? Seven or eight? <laughs> this is fifth year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one thing to take a couple of extra courses uh, after your uh, you know four year graduation period. They should have been expired, uh, and you're thinking, well, geez, I, like I did, I had to go to uh, Hofstra for six credits in a summer uh, course, and uh, that that was more intense than the entire four years I put in at Syracuse because I actually had to go to class, which uh, you know. I mean, that was a very, very arduous uh, piece of labor for me, considering I'd been goofing off for the last four years straight <laughs> without ever. I, I, You know, it's a good thing uh, if they'd had GPS, I guess, back then, uh, I would have been able to find a campus. But uh, otherwise, you know, I'm asking people like I'm coming in from my freshman year. Hey, hey, uh, yeah, do you know where Haven Hall is? I'm not sure. I can find it. <laughs> I got a chemistry class there. Actually, that was a dormitory, but it was the first, uh, you know, building that popped into my head. Why, Luby? It was the hot chicks from Long Island were all in the uh, cafeteria there at Haven Hall. There was nothing like a panty raid at Haven Hall. (laughs) Did you do panty raids when you were at uh, Florida State? What's a panty? A panty raid? Yeah. I mean, that means you you, you go and storm like a girl's dormitory and just start partying. Did you ever do that? Most of the dorms, I think, were... Oh, they were co-ed by then. Yeah. Co-ed. And, I mean, after freshman year, you didn't live in a dorm. And there were it was FSU. There were, like I told you, between FSU and TCC and fam, there were girls everywhere. It was, I mean, it, you didn't have to look. Oh, Florida State, yeah. Women. That was tremendous. <laughs> Women were everywhere. I mean, if you're doing the math and you have one of those Barron's guides to um, all of the uh, colleges and universities and you're trying to pick a school, ratio men to women is the number one consideration for me. Academics, uh, be damned. I could have ended up as a coal miner. <laughs> as long as I was getting laid in college, uh, that, that was going to be a good thing. Anyway, uh, congratulations to the Owls, man. I, uh, very impressive. 62-55 over Tennessee. Yeah. And uh, now uh, it's up to the University of Miami. Uh, not that they're competing with, with uh, Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic did. Uh, I mean, uh, the path was cleared by Fairleigh Dickinson when Purdue yep. got knocked out. I, I'm not sure that uh, FAU would have lost to Purdue. They, weren't uh, they obviously were able to handle fairly Dickinson uh, without, uh, I mean, it, it was not an easy game, but, uh, and, and that may have been their toughest game so far that they, they uh, really took over in the second half. I, I turned away, like I said, and started watching UCLA Gonzaga. And I turned back thinking that FAU, this was it. Their, their number was up. They, they were just going to get knocked out. They were down five at halftime and uh, they were playing horrible basketball at that stage. And I, I don't know that you could have foreseen the turnaround, but uh, whatever they did uh, going into the uh, locker room uh, and uh, coming out for the second half, a uh, big difference there. And uh, this Dusty May deserves a lot of credit, doesn't he? Yes. I mean, does he not look like one, one of the better coaches, uh, period, in the tournament with all the illustrious names? I mean, we're all familiar with uh, the guys that have been around for a long time, and you have guys in different positions than they were when you first started following them. And, uh, you know, even looking at uh, the uh, Tennessee coach, uh, Barnes, who, who's been – Everywhere. Successful at four or five, you know, big time programs. He's had success. And um, here's Dusty May goes in at halftime and says, you know what we got to do, guys? We got to do this. We got to do that. And boom, bada bing, bada bang. And uh, next thing you know, they're they're up. They, they ran off like a 15 to two run or something like that. They got up to 20 to four. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, Tennessee had no response. I mean, zero. They didn't even have a pulse in the second half. And. Uh, good job there. FEU's uh, been doing I mean, they, they've won now, I think, 35 ball games on the season. I, I mean, sure. They do a good job of closing games out, don't they? Yes. They, they, they don't relinquish leads. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're not making dumb plays like Virginia did when oh, they were yeah. knocked down in the tournament where, where you know, a, a star guard, an All-American guard throws the ball up in the air and it goes to half court and they lose. They're not making those kind of horrendous mistakes. UConn looked dominant though last night. Canes in Houston. Now, what kind of chance? Uh, you you're, you weren't uh, optimistic been... about either of these two local teams going any further. So, uh, have you amended your posi- uh, position there, Mike Luby Lubitz? I'm gonna just ride my position. I I was rooting for FAU, and I didn't think they'd get trounced or anything, and it wasn't gonna be a shock if they won. I just felt like this is the round that teams that are good but not great usually get knocked out. FAU is starting to lean toward great. I mean, that performance in the second half, even when it got down to five with three minutes left, you're not, they were the opposite of Virginia. They were composed. They're like, all right, we're good. They went and scored. They went and scored that next possession. It got up to like seven or eight and they just coasted the rest of the way. You and I don't know. I, 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 Houston, I, there are one seed for a reason, but a lot of people I've talked to, including the professor, they're very streaky and UM, 
can be streaky too, but it feels like they have enough guys that like if Wong's off, Miller or Pack will pick it up. And with Omir, they've just been very consistent. Even when they struggled at the end, it wasn't that they struggled. They were pounding FSU. They just took their foot off the pedal. Like they've been consistently good the entire year, except for when Omir got hurt. Omir does not look hurt. Um, I just feel like this is where they'll lose. But maybe they'll prove me wrong. They'll make me very happy. I'd love to see both at UM and FAU in the friggin' Elite Eight. <laughs> that would be crazy. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> that would be crazy. A town that still doesn't give a shit. They still don't give a shit. Like, Nobody I was cares, yeah. last night, and we were at Landlubbers, and the t- it's Sue Freen, so the TVs have every single game on, which is amazing, and it's great. No one was, like, hooting and hollering. <laughs> like, no one thing anything. Uh, probably, uh, I guess, you know, the last couple of ball games uh, where, where, you know, you start to hear your subliminal uh, voices, uh, you know, coming through loud and clear, and they're saying, "Get yourself in front of a television set and watch this ball game." Yeah, well, yeah. And, and that's mostly because uh, we developed a little rapport now. I feel like with uh, Dusty May. Uh, other than that, <laughs> uh, you're right. You're absolutely right. I, I you think the people in Boca were uh, canceling their reservations at local restaurants and saying, uh, "You know what? I, I don't feel like going to Louis Bossy tonight." <laughs> FAU's on TV. <laughs> They should, but not. <laughs> not happening here, man. This is basketball la la land. It really is. Oh, my God. Yeah. That was a wild game, though. One of the best games. I mean, there have been several. The tournament's been wildly entertaining, even if you're not a big time college basketball fan. So some of these conclusions uh, Michigan State, Kansas State well, was an excellent ball game all the way through. I didn't see a ton of that game, but uh, the highlights were great. And, uh, you know, what I did see what was uh, spectacular goes to overtime. I, I was asked, uh, you know, uh, one of those uh, topical sports questions today, early in the morning. I get a uh, text from the lovely and talented one uh, before we even started uh, this endeavor. And she says, uh, who would you rather have, Noel or Timmy? Get with it. What was her uh, remark, by the way? I, know, I like that. I want the heat to get Noel. He's short, but he's he's five eight guys. The dude set the ace assist single assist record at the NCAA tournament. Nineteen uh, dimes, as they say. But at twenty points, he was and his passes are great. He was throwing them with one hand, yes. hitting the pocket for the shooter. I was like, "Fuck, man, he could use a guy like a guy." Like uh, it was Stockton esque. I mean, a variety of, of uh, different types of passes that he was throwing. Uh, I mean, behind his back, around the shoulders, uh, backwards, forwards, uh, lobbing the ball across court. Uh, you know, he he did it. Bounce passes to the inside. Uh, a really uh, tremendous uh, arsenal and display of uh, passing expertise, and he scored twenty points also. Yep. So uh, yep. holy mugsy bogues! I mean, uh, I, I don't know, uh, Drew Timmy. I'm not sure that he prospers as much in the pros, especially, well, if he gets the end to Tecumpo uh, rules, uh, then then he'll be fine because this guy shuffles his feet and changes pivot feet like nobody I've ever seen, and, and they never call it, man. What are they looking at? Are they looking at Mark Few's wife in the stands agonizing over every possession? What do you think? Come on, ref. I mean, I've never seen a guy shuffle his feet so much. Uh, the guy uh, looks like he's getting ready to tap dance. <laughs> Good player, though. I'm not going to take anything away from him. No, he's but, a college player. I just don't know yeah. what he's going to do in the pros. In the pros, I don't think he has enough range uh, to uh, make that work, right? I mean, Zion Williamson could at least put up, uh, you know, some 15, 16-foot shots, maybe even hit an occasional three. Yes. Keep everybody honest uh, with the outside jumper once in a while. Not that that's going to be his go-to move. Uh, but I didn't realize that Timmy was a bricklayer from the free throw line. Did you? He's an okay free throw shooter, and he's not a three point shooter. And the, the difference is Zion, who's shorter, is an athletic freak and yeah. a really good passer, has really good vision. Timmy is a big, but he's not big, and he can't shoot threes, and the bigs need to stretch it out. And he's not athletic, like he's sort of a clod. Yes. So he's uh, not. I mean, it works in college, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, who's he going to defend? <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that same approach you had to women in college doesn't necessarily work in the pros because yeah. uh, the first question after, uh, you, you know, do you remember what color my eyes are is uh, what kind of bank account you got? Yes. Yeah, what do you do? <laughs> By the way, do you know what color Shirley's eyes are? The brown. Okay. No, no, yeah, the brown. That's always a good guess, right? Because that's the dominant color. But uh, you know, that, that was one that always got me, man. Because <laughs> you don't really think. It's funny. I have to think about it. I'm just going to go with brown. Yeah. Even if you stare at something, you don't really look at their, like, I don't know. You don't think about I don't know. I don't really think about her eyes. I'm like, oh, your eyes. Like, All right. Well, that's our in-depth sports coverage for today. <laughs> Cats are now one point out of a playoff spot. Yeah, Mike Mayo are. will be happy about that. Our good buddy, Mike Mayo. They're a joke. Uh, he, he, uh, you know. He, 
I mean, uh, there, there was a time I, I, I had to secretly uh, root against all of our local teams because it was easier to sell losing than it was to sell winning here in this town, which is a you know, strange phenomenon. And uh, the Heat are in sixth place now because uh, Brooklyn lost last night. And uh, Brooklyn, I believe, also has to face the Cavaliers again. That, that was a wild game, a wild finish with a three-pointer by the Cavs out of the corner to win it in the final seconds after Brooklyn had come back in dramatic fashion. So good stuff was going on, and even though the Heat were idle, uh, they ended up picking up a very important uh, game, half a game in the uh, standings there, and now moved into the sixth position in the standings. And uh, you were saying that this was something you were actually right about, Luby. You said, I, I, I'm waiting for Brooklyn to fall completely apart. I mean, it's taking And they've now lost four in a row. It's taking longer than I thought it would take. The Heat and Nets actually play Saturday. The Knicks also lost as well to the Magic. Yes. And the Heat are now only in one and a half back of the Knicks, and they play the Knicks again next week. So they actually control their own destiny. If they can win their games, they'll be in the fifth spot, which is yeah. Two words, on, though, for you on that. Donovan Mitchell. Yeah, he's Since a great you're rooting player. for them to uh, play the Cavs. Donovan right. Mitchell. Cat's well, been great. All right, we have to run. Uh, we'll uh, do it again on Monday. Uh, glad you guys are tuning in to Defo on 5. We have our uh, shows coming up on South Florida Live, 7 to 9 today. It's a degenerate Friday on the Defo show, and we'll feature many of our uh, usual suspects when it comes to special guests and handicapping degenerates. And the Mike Mayo Lunchbox, speaking of degenerates, uh, comes to you live from Gulfstream Park today at 12 o'clock. So uh, check that out, and I believe... Our special guest will be the illustrious and uh, longtime iconic broadcaster here in South Florida, the great Tony Segreto. So uh, looking forward to that. We'll be out at the stream later on. And that, uh, it's a tough place for me to talk myself into going at 12 o'clock <laughs> for some reason. It is amazing. Uh, I, I could put my car. It doesn't have this feature, but I could put it on automatic pilot, and it just rolls right into the parking lot there at Gulfstream. So uh, we'll see you later on. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you Monday, the next edition of Default on 5. Thank you.